today we're going to talk about trade protectionism. Now we concluded the last unit by talking about uh, three reasons trade is international trade is so productive and so beneficial. We focused on the division of labor, division of knowledge effects, we focused on the economies of scale effects, and then we focused on the comparative advantage effects. And we concluded by saying basically that trade is the basis of all wealth. Now this kind of leads us to an interesting question. If trade is so great, why is there so much controversy? And I've put some pictures up here that try to capture some of the um, opponents of free international trade and some of their big themes. They say international, uh, free international trade is unfair. They say uh, companies are enslaving third world workers in these sweatshop uh, conditions in these, um, in these manufacturing companies. Um, protesting against the WTO, the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization is trying to liberalize trade, is trying to reduce trade barriers, and these people are suggesting that that's somehow creating injustice. Uh, what's going on? Uh, and then finally here we have people suggesting that um, if you buy American, you can protect your job because foreign competition is taking jobs away from American workers. Oh no. They took our job! They took our job! They took your job! They took our job! They took your job! They took your job! Alright, so people have these uh, fears and compulsions about international trade, and this is going to lead into what we call protectionist policies, policies, policies that are meant to protect American companies and American workers from the effects of freer international trade. Now, to analyze this, I want us to think in terms not of trade per se, but in terms of competition. What's really happening here? Why are people so irritated? Why are their emotions run so high? And the, as that South Park clip captured, there's just a lot of resentment created about um, Americans just doing business with uh, people overseas, mutually beneficial exchange here. Why are people get so worked up about this? Well, it's competition. Okay. More trade means more competition, and when we have global uh, free trade, we have global competition. That's the maximum competition possible. And competition is going to hurt people who aren't that competitive. Okay. Specifically, we're talking about high-cost domestic uh, producers of certain goods. Okay. Competition's interesting because we have a, we kind of have a love-hate relationship here. We think about competition from the standpoint of consumers. We think this is great. Okay, why? Well, remember in a long-run equilibrium in uh, competitive markets, this is your micro review. Price equals minimum average total cost. Okay, price is brought down to equal cost, and the cost is minimized. And consumers therefore get all the surplus. Okay, and who's a consumer? If we're in the classroom, I say raise your hand if you're a consumer. Of course, you better be raising your hand, otherwise I'll think you're a zombie. You uh, you can walk around without consuming anything, right? Consumers is all of us. Consumers, we are all consumers. We get all the surplus in a competitive situation. Okay, consumers win. Here's my favorite example, Walmart. What do they advertise here? Low prices. Okay. They don't advertise great service. They don't advertise a high class clientele. They advertise low prices. How do they achieve those low prices? Part of it's economies of scale. Okay. Part of it is um, highly specialized networking, distribution, and these kind of things. And part of it is, indeed, because they rely largely on international trade to bring in cheap, goods, low priced goods that are sourced in uh, foreign countries, okay, made by low cost foreign labor. Okay, now producers on the other hand, this is the hate part of that love-hate relationship, producers might not like competition, especially high cost producers, because they can be undersold, they become unprofitable, uh, profit and loss mechanism of the competitive market economy. If you can't meet the costs of the competition, you suffer losses, you eventually go out of business. And here's the view of the uh, high cost competitors. You'll notice there that Walmart is viewed as this just giant monster that's coming to gobble them up. All these local companies, okay, they took out the hardware store, the drug store, the clothing store, the grocer, and now they're coming for the bank. This is a few years back. Um, yeah, some people might have a um, might have an aesthetic for 
these small quaint you know mom and pop type companies the downtown stores but let's face it Walmart says low prices again okay people choose Walmart because the prices are low okay lower prices mean higher real incomes mean more consumer surplus okay so this is what's going on here competition is really what people don't like so much and international trade means international competition now one common misconception about economics is that well economists you're just shills for big business well not really if we're shills for anyone we're shills for the consumer okay Look what Adam Smith said about what businesses are going to do in response to competition. Okay. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, then the, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Some contrivance to raise prices. What's causing the prices to go down? Competition. How are they going to contrive to raise prices? they're going to have to put the kibosh on competition. In the realm of international trade, what we're going to look at is the tools of protectionism, which are going to be tariffs, quotas, and subsidies. Okay. A tariff is a tax on imported goods. The goal is to make to raise the price of imported goods to make domestically produced goods as competitive because foreign goods are no longer cheaper. A quota is a limitation on the amount of uh, foreign goods that can be imported and a subsidy is having your own government cover part of your cost of production by of course using taxpayer funds in order for the domestic producers to be able to sell sell at lower prices okay. so these are the tools that we're going to see these uh, domestic producers use to try to insulate themselves from the effects of foreign competition okay. and let me go back here to David Hume with our key behavioral assumption assume all men are knaves okay they're going to pursue their self-interest even at the expense of other people's economic gain okay? and what they're going to use is a political formula which we're familiar with from our study of fiscal policy concentrate the benefits of these protectionist policies on a very small group of people who have a lot at stake disperse the cost of these protectionist policies over a large large group of consumers who individually have very little at stake and probably aren't even aware of these protectionist policies to begin with okay so with that in mind we can take a look we can graph out um, what international trade gives us and then we'll look at what happens when this market is protected okay take a look at uh, just, this is the semiconductors example from the textbook okay and what we have is domestic supply and domestic demand and without free international trade we'd have this uh, basic equilibrium right here price no trade quantity no trade what free trade gives us if we can tap into the world market we're going to view this as a supply curve that is flat in other words it's perfectly elastic at the world price and why this is is because the U.S. is viewed as such a small segment of the world semiconductor market that we can increase our purchases of semiconductors quite a bit without considerably raising the world's um, price. Okay, it's a perfectly elastic world supply curve. So what we're going to see is that we can expand our quantity up to QD free trade, okay, and lower the price from P no trade down to world price. This is what trade gives us, more competition, lower prices, more product bought at lower prices. And what it does is expands consumer surplus. Consumer surplus used to be this area here before we had free trade. Okay. What free trade does by pushing the price down to this level here gives all of this extra surplus for the consumers. Okay. Remember, in competitive markets and fully competitive globally competitive markets with free trade consumers get all the surplus now as we said assume all men are knaves in the domestic semiconductor uh, companies are they going to sit idly by and watch their own surplus get whittled down to this tiny amount down here here's the remaining producer surplus well we shouldn't expect the semiconductor industry to take this lightly we might expect them to pursue a protectionist policy in Congress with the U.S. government.
Okay. We'll talk about a little bit more how they do that. They'll basically lobby Congress and they'll make campaign contributions to the key people in congressional committees and they'll try to get Congress to impose some kind of protection. Okay. Let's assume that they'll go for a tariff. Let's assume that they go for a tariff and then we'll model the effects of that right here with this diagram. Now first off what we want to take a look at is the effects of the tariff. It pushes the price up pushes the supply curve up by the amount of the tariff okay? and consumers are now paying the higher price here at tariff equilibrium rather than free trade equilibrium so if the price goes up we know the quantity demanded goes down and that's what's happening right here okay? and as the price goes up it now becomes profitable for the domestic companies to sell more up their own supply curve so domestic companies are going to make this move here on their own supply curve and they're going to sell this much more here we're still going to import some, which is this amount here. Okay. A higher price, part of it's the tariff. The tariff revenue goes to the government, of course. What happens to consumer surplus? Well, consumers have lost some of their surplus. It used to go all the way down to here. Now it's going to stop right here. Okay, so that red triangle I just drew in is the new consumer surplus. It's lower. You'll notice producers, they were at this tiny area of surplus down here, or they're going to steal away some of the surplus from consumers. Okay? So producers transfer some surplus to themselves. That's not the whole story. Because what we're going to see happens to the rest of the surplus. Now this chunk of it right here is transferred to the government in the form of tariff revenues. But notice that this little chunk right here and this little chunk right here is surplus that's gone. Okay? And we can uh, analyze these two chunks of lost surplus specifically. We'll focus on this little segment here of as a deadweight loss. This is trade that does not happen, okay, because the quantity these quantities are no longer bought and sold, so there's no surplus that accrues from them anymore. And this little chunk right here, this is going to be what we call the value of wasted resources used to pursue the purchase of uh, semiconductors at an artificially high price. We could have had the good, what we're saying here is we could have had the good down here at this low price and we s foolishly imposed a higher price on ourselves. Well paying more than you need to, paying more than the, min the lowest market price for the same good, we call that, you know, we have a special term for that in econ, waste inefficiency. Okay. So we've got inefficiency in this market, and we've got a pure loss of cons consumer surplus. And this is why we frown on trade protectionism so much. It's just needlessly taking away benefits from consumers. Okay. It's utterly needless. Okay. It's, it's just a pure waste. Okay, now I want to give a, a specific example of, a, of an industry that uses some... Um, trade protection measures to uh, protect itself from foreign competition and in consequence keeps the prices uh, higher for consumers, reducing surplus and imposing waste on the economy. Example that's used in the textbook, I think this is a classic example because it's very easy to see the, f the fallacy of the protection here is the U.S. sugar industry. Okay. Did you know? Most people weren't aware of this. The U.S. sugar industry imposes a system of tariffs and quotas um, by the federal government to dramatically reduce sugar imports into the U.S. and therefore to promote higher prices for U.S. made sugar. And consumers therefore have to pay, and it's, and it's, and it's been f for the past several decades about twice the world price. Okay? We're paying twice as much for sugar as we need to. Okay? And again, this is kind of the thing, raise your hand if you're a sugar consumer. This is the vast majority of us, okay? And we might not, we're talking about, you know, buying a five pound bag of sugar at the grocery store, but we're also talking about anything that's uh, sweetened food products, okay? We're talking candy, we're talking colas, we're talking um, baked goods, you name it, okay? Anything with sugar in it, we're paying too much because of trade protectionist policies. Okay, now, and here's a chart of sugar prices, uh, U.S. versus world from 82 to a couple years ago. Current price differentials, it's moved up a little bit more, but it's still, that you'll see that the U.S. price here is about double the world price here. It's, okay, it's been about double. It moves up and down, of course, just like any product will. 
moves up and down with change in supply and demand. But U.S. protection policies will strive to keep the U.S. price about double the world price. Okay, now, you might be wondering, um, what exactly are we protecting with this policy? Well, when you think of U.S. sugar industry, what do you think? You know, Florida, cane sugar. Okay, cane sugar grown in uh, Florida, Louisiana, and parts of Texas. Uh, actually, the bulk of the sugar industry, you ready for this, is in North Dakota, Minnesota, in the upper Midwest. Okay, we're, we're talking sugar beets, okay, not sugar cane. We grow most of our sugar way up in the northern part of the country. Why do they need... Now, these are very productive sugar, uh, sugar growing country, but why do they need... Uh, trade protection policies because the truth is if we opened up trade with Brazil and Cuba and parts of uh, other parts of Africa and South America uh, they could produce sugar much more effectively mainly because they've got a longer growing season they get a bigger yield okay they're, they're in the tropics whereas we're growing sugar in North Dakota okay so if we were open to free trade we'd have a much lower um, sugar price because the cost of production are much, much lower in those uh, warmer tropical climates. Okay. We keep our sugar industry alive by restricting imports of sugar. Let's look at the effect of this on the graph. Okay, And this is from the textbook and this is um, the data here is a little bit old just the current price is somewhat higher than this but the, um, the overall effect is going to be captured pretty well here. Okay. Notice first off that we have um, a domestic supply curve that's steeply upward sloping, okay, right here. Domestic demand curve is steeply downward sloping. It's an inelastic demand curve. Hopefully you remember what that means for micro. What that means is that um, if the price changes a lot, and you see we're paying double the world price here, we're paying 20, the world price is 9, more than double. If the world price doubles, output only goes down here about 25%, something like that. Okay. That's inelastic demand. We we gots to have our sugar, so to speak. Okay. So what we wind up doing is just paying a much higher price up here for a not that much lower quantity. Therefore, what will we see happens in the graph? Well, okay, if we had free trade, all of this would be consumer surplus, above price, below the demand curve. Because the world supply is so large, it's the same thing as with our previous example. The world supply is so large that we're going to say we could buy as much as we want at the world price of nine cents without putting much upward pressure on the price. So the world supply curve is this horizontal supply curve. Okay, we would have all of this as consumer surplus, but because of trade protectionist policies that jack the price up here to twenty cents, consumer surplus is cut down to just this area here. Okay. What happened to all of our surplus? Well, the producer stole half of it from us right here. Okay, area A, this is transferred to producer surplus above the supply curve below the price. Area B here, this is just pure waste. Okay, we're paying 20 cents for sugar when we could only when we only should be paying 9 cents. Okay, we only need to pay 9 cents. Okay. This represents the wasted resources that go into making sugar in the US for twice the world price. Okay? Using resources to produce something that could be produced for half the price somewhere else, that is pure waste. Okay? And then area C here, because we do see something of a reduction in sugar bought and consumed in the US, that is just a pure dead weight loss. Okay? That's consumer surplus that never happens because we cut ourselves off from the cheaper foreign supply. Okay, so all of this waste, area B and area C, those are lost. Area A is just transferred. Okay, but it would have all been consumer surplus. Half of it's lost, and about half is transferred to producers. We can actually calculate the effects here. Okay, we can actually calculate the loss because we see that the price difference is 11 cents per pound of sugar, and we're buying 20. Um, well, we would be buying 24 billion pounds, but let's just run with the 20 billion pounds number. 20 billion pounds times 11 cents is going to equal 2.2 billion dollars. Okay, 2.2 billion dollar loss for the consumers of America. About half of it, about a billion of it's transferred over to producers. About half of it's just wasted, dead weight loss or wasted resources. 
Okay. Now, you might be wondering, well, gee, that's a lot of money. That's a needless waste of consumer surplus. Why don't we do something about it? Why don't we stand up? Why don't we call our congressmen and say, stop imposing this ridiculous, wasteful sugar protection policy on it? Okay, to understand the persistence, we need to go back to, to this uh, political formula of concentrating the benefits onto a small elite interest group and dispersing the cost over the general consumer. Okay, Now remember, not all of that benefit was uh, for the producer surplus. Some of it was just waste. So let's say producers get about half of it. Let's say producers get a billion. And let's be very generous and very conservative and assume there's 100,000 producers okay now and we want to realize the people really getting the benefits here are not the workers in the sugar factories or in the sugar farms okay they're just supplying a fairly non specific labor input um, if there was no sugar industry they would go work somewhere else for roughly the same wage the people really benefiting from the sugar protection policy are the landowners and the capital owners in the sugar industry because if we had free international trade in sugar, U.S. land would not be used to grow sugar. It would be used to grow things like corn and soybeans and wheat and all of that. Now, there would be some value to the land, but not as much because there's not as much profit given that those are more competitive markets. Okay. The real value, is, the real um, gains are going to be concentrated even more than in these sugar capital owners, okay? people who own sugar refineries, sugar factories, because there wouldn't be much of a domestic market for sugar if we had full free international competition and the value of those uh, capital installations would fall probably close to zero in many cases. Okay. So there's probably really only something like 10,000 people who are the actual land and capital owners. In fact, I'm going to run with that number. And we'll see then that the billion dollars of transferred surplus divided by 10,000 maybe uh, capital owners that amounts to $100,000 per person. That's a huge gain. And what do you think they're going to do to protect that uh, gain, to protect the value of their land and capital, which would fall otherwise to zero in the face of foreign competition? They are going to lobby. They are going to throw money at Congress people to make sure they can maintain this policy, uh, even though it screws the consumer. Well, how do they, how do they reconcile that? Well, they tend to ignore the consumer. They uh, they say it's all about the jobs, and they say, hey, it's good for our business. Assume all men are knaves, okay? Assume all men are knaves. This is a classic example. Am I calling these people knaves? Well, yeah, I basically am, okay? They probably haven't studied the economics. They mean well, okay? But they're knaves. The fact is they are abusing American consumers to protect their own economic interests. Okay. Now, the costs are going to be dispersed. The costs amount to that full $2.2 billion. Okay, because we want to count the transferred surplus and the dead weight loss. Those are going to be dispersed amongst all of us who are sugar consumers. Let me just go ahead and assume that all of us are sugar consumers. And what we're going to get here, okay, there's 315 million people in the country. We're suffering a loss of 2.2 billion. On average, we're losing about $7 per person. Here's the thing. How hard do you think the sugar interests are going to lobby and campaign and fight to keep their sugar protection policy in place when they have $100,000 at stake? Pretty hard, huh? How hard are we going to fight when we have $7 per person at stake? Mm, not so hard. Okay. In fact, we don't even have an incentive to be informed about this because the stakes are so low for us. How many of you knew about the sugar protection policies before this class? Be honest now. None of you, right? You know now, and you're just going to be depressed because you realize there's nothing you can do to oust this interest group dynamic. I was just reading about this very issue, and there are congresspeople, there are congressmen from the non-sugar states, okay? Indiana is a non-sugar growing state. We're a sugar consuming state, okay? We got six million sugar consumers, zero sugar producers. You would think our whole congressional delegation would be in there trying to get rid of the sugar policy because it's wasteful, it's inefficient, it benefits the few at the expense of the many, it's anti-economic. Uh, but they haven't been able to do it. 
Other people in Congress have tried repeatedly for the past several decades to get rid of the sugar protection. They can't do it because the sugar lobby fights so hard and is so powerful. I'm going to post on the class blog an article that explains some of the process by which they exert their power. If you're curious, it's a very interesting story. It's kind of a, a tragic story of democratic politics, but nonetheless, it's something that you should know about. Okay, one last thing I want to look at with respect to the sugar protectionist uh, policies, and I'm citing a little uh, report that was put out by the Cato Institute, which is a free trade, free market promoting uh, think tank in Washington. And this is about the what they call the sugar racket. This is from a few years back, in 07. Uh, this policies persist, and they have similar costs every year. Okay. So this study is going to detail some of the costs here. You can see the um, two, the two billion and higher sugar costs for consumers annually. That's pretty similar to the result we just found. Okay. What the uh, sugar lobby? Do you think they're going to go out and say, "Well, we need a sugar pro uh, trade protectionist policy to uh, keep us fat and happy, to keep our capital value high, uh, and to hell with the consumer"? No, of course they're not going to pitch it that way. They're going to say, "What are they going to say?" jobs. What's that? What are they going to say? Oh, that's right, they're going to use that, that holy incantation of politics, which is to say, it's for the jobs, it's to protect the jobs, don't you know? The jobs, the jobs, the jobs. Well, okay, this uh, report has some interesting facts about that, because you have to realize, okay, that, yeah, well, will the sugar protectionist policy protect jobs in the sugar producing industry in the U.S.? Yes, it will. It sure will. But it's going to hurt all consumers. Okay, it's going to hurt consumers of sugar. That's us when we go buy sugar at the grocery store, or any kind of sweet food products or candy. But think about the companies that use sugar in their own production process. Okay, companies like candy companies and cola companies and bakeries. What happens there? Well, take a look at what uh, the report says. Okay. Last year, the U.S. Department of Commerce studied the economic effects of federal sugar policies and released the Damon Report that had five key findings. Employment in U.S. food businesses that use substantial amounts of sugar is declining. For each sugar-growing job, let me highlight this, for each sugar-growing and sugar-harvesting job saved by current sugar policies, nearly three confectionery manufacturing jobs are lost. Who can take a sunrise, sprinkle it with dew, comfort it in chocolate and a miracle or two? It's the candy man. The candy man can. The candy man can. As he mixes it with love and makes the world taste good. Except in this case, the candy man can't. What this is doing is ruining the U.S. candy industry, or at least reducing uh, jobs and employment in the U.S. candy industry, on account of the higher costs of sugar imposed by the uh, protectionist policies. Okay. Furthermore, we go on to read here, the sugar costs are a major reason why some U.S. sugar-using businesses are relocating their factories abroad. Numerous food companies have relocated to Canada, where sugar prices are less than half of U.S. prices, and Mexico, where prices are two-thirds as high. Okay. Imports of food products that contain sugar are growing rapidly because it is not competitive to manufacture those items in the United States. And here's some specific examples. Um, We've seen that uh, Fannie Mae left Chicago, Brock's moved to Mexico, Kraft moved Lifesavers from Michigan to Canada to access low-cost sugar, Hershey closed plants in Pennsylvania, Colorado, and California, and relocated them to Canada. Okay. So they're going to tell you stories about, oh, we're going to save jobs, but even that's a lie, even if that were worthwhile, which it wouldn't be because the jobs aren't efficient and productive in the U.S., but even so, it's a lie, okay? We lose more jobs than the cost. We impose co higher costs on consumers. All around, this is a wasteful and inefficient policy, okay? It's just a very terrible policy. Okay, so let me sum up. I know this is kind of a depressing lesson, but it's one we need to learn, okay? Let me sum up with our protectionist story. The sugar barons, as they're known, actually this refers to um, some of the specific capital, uh, sh sugar capitalists down in Florida. Um, they win big from this policy. Okay, they're the ones earning these these artificially inflated uh, prices and higher profits. 
course the politicians win as well and I, as I said I'll post an article that talks about how the sugar barons and the people in the sugar industry are very careful about donating to the right politicians okay they're basically buying themselves a the continuation of these policies okay. of course we all lose but it's only seven dollars a person so it's not that noticeable and we don't have much incentive to fight it okay US sugar using businesses as I just mentioned okay locating overseas they're losing jobs they're losing um, they're facing higher costs okay. and finally let's not forget about this kind of this unseen this forgotten man here which is the foreign sugar f farmers producers a lot of them are in Brazil it's not the only country but I, uh, I focus on them okay. these folks are um, losing access to the world's one of the world's biggest sugar consuming markets and that's hurting their prospects to uh, grow and expand their industries as well of course their problem is that they don't vote in US elections, they're not represented in US politics, they can't donate to US politicians, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that is a story about the sad, sad effects of trade protectionism. Okay. Fortunately, while protectionism is, is somewhat commonplace, we still have quite a bit of international trade and we still have, you know, have prospects for growing international trade, although it, it declined somewhat during the recession in 2009 it's rebounded since then and uh, globalization is uh, is still a live factor in the current economy it's a it's a good thing in general it's a good process okay it integrates the world economy it bring it makes the world economy more competitive it brings costs down for consumers everywhere consumers get all the surplus now the last the uh, next and final piece that I want to discuss in the context of international trade is this big controversy about the trade deficit okay when we talk about international trade we'll hear lots of complaints about oh our trade deficit is it's so terrible well is it really well stay tuned and in our final lecture of this unit we will address the uh, a little bit of international finance and we'll talk about the trade deficit see you then